Okay, so let me move this over here. There we go. So before I start, does anybody have any questions about anything that has to do with the review or the test or anything like that? Let me make sure my speaker is on. Okay, there we go. So if we- I feel like, yes. I feel like the most, I guess, trouble I have is with um, the piecewise ones and the ones where you like, I guess, make, like create the, find the equation or like write out the equation. Okay, gotcha. So yeah, like, I don't- do those first then. For sure. Go ahead. I was just saying, I don't really know how to do those or that well. <laughs> okay, like, no problem, no problem. We'll talk about them for sure. But just to make sure that we talk about them in class, I'll actually cover those first. If nobody has any objection to that, <laughs> that's what we'll do, okay? So make sure that we get to those since you're, you're curious about those. Um, okay. So for the piecewise, I'm gonna go ahead and do both of them. This is the one that's actually asking you to graph it, but this one's not so, so bad, okay? So we'll start by explaining this problem. So I know it's kind of tiny on your screen, but it says, um, use the piecewise defined function to find the following values for f of x. This is the piecewise defined function, and then these are all the f of x values that they're asking for, okay? So for this one, they're saying that x equals zero. Now you just need to figure out which piece are you supposed to be plugging in zero, right? Because normally if you're asking me for f of something, I have to plug in that number. But which one do we do? Now the biggest error that I get on this problem is that people will plug the x into all three and give me three answers. There is not three answers. There is one answer for this box. And you need to make sure you're picking the correct piece to plug in the zero, okay? So you essentially have to figure out which neighborhood does the zero live in? And then depending on which neighborhood the zero lives in, that's the piece that you're gonna plug the zero into, okay? So as far as you having a number line here, I see the numbers three and I see the number seven. Okay, so this says that x is less than or equal to three. This part in here is between three and seven. And then this part over here is x is greater than or equal to seven, okay? So if you're looking at that number line, where would zero be? It would be somewhere over here, right? So if zero is in this chunk, then that's the function or the piece of the function that I must plug the zero into. So I would have four minus three times zero, which is just four minus zero or just four. And so I get one single response for that box. Similarly, if I'm looking at the X value of one, Again, where is one in this whole number line? That would be three, two, one, it would be here. It's inside that same region, which means I'm going to be using that same piece of the function. So I'm now I'm gonna plug in one for X. This time we get four minus three, which is actually one. Now the next X value, and you won't be asked for five of these things, you'll only be asked for one. <laughs> but I guess to get practice, there's a whole bunch of them in here. So now four though, four would actually be over here, right? Four, five, six, and then seven. So four is actually over here somewhere. And so it's actually in this little region, okay? And that little region means I have to plug in the four into this piece. So it would be four times four, which is 16. Now for the next one, the X value here is five. 
So then three, four, five, that's actually in that same middle piece, right? So then I would have to use that same middle piece of the function. So it'd be four times five, which is 20. And please interrupt me and stop me, right? If you have questions, anything like that, make sure you stop me. Seven's a little bit tricky. Seven is right here in the center, isn't it? Okay. So that one's a little bit different. It's right there on the on the the cusp of where this thing is changing. So you really have to pay attention. Does this interval include the seven, or does this interval include the seven? Who's got that equal bar? Okay. Over here it says x equals seven. So this, when you're right on top of seven, it's actually considered to be in this region, not in that region, because that region does not have the little bar on it. So it doesn't ever equal seven in that region. It just goes real close to seven, but it never actually equals seven, okay? So if I wanna do seven exactly, it's actually gonna be part of this piece, which means I have to use this piece of the function to plug in my seven. So it's gonna be five times seven plus four, which is 35 plus four which is 39. So then the only answer in there is the 39. So you must figure out where that X value lives and then you can pick which piece of the function you can plug it into, okay? That's the big, big idea there. Now for the graphing one, this was the one we had a concern about. For this one, the best technique I can give you is to draw two tables because you have two pieces of your function, right? So you've got two pieces of the function. So I wanna make two tables and I'm gonna use this as the Y value for the top. And then this as the Y value for the bottom, okay? And so you have two separate tables that we're gonna use. And now you, the X values that you put in these tables are very important that you follow the little bounds for your X values. So here it says one, so I definitely need to plug in the one, but it says X is less, right? It looks like an L, a slanted L. So that's less than one. So I need other numbers that are less than one. Now, since this is a line and this is a line, right? There's no squares or cubes or anything crazy. Um, you only need two points to draw a line. So I'm just gonna pick one other number that's less than one, like maybe zero, okay? Then over here for the other chart, I have to use the same thing, the bottom description. Now here it says one again, so I have to use the one but it says X is greater. This one does not look like an L, so it's greater. Another X value greater than one would be like two. Now you have to figure out the points, what the points are gonna look like, okay? So since these numbers were the numbers that they identified, those numbers are gonna have special points. They're either gonna be like big giant solid dots or big giant open dots, okay? Since for the top function, it has the bar on it, this one's gonna actually have a solid dot, okay? And then for the bottom function, which is this function over here, the X has no bar on it, so it should have an open dot. All the other X values that we just came up with are just gonna be regular, normal dots, okay? So I always just try to make sure that and they look like dots, but they're not like exaggerated, right? Like the big round black one or the big round uh, open one, okay? So it's not even black, it's <laughs> it should have just said solid, it's orange. But in here, they look like they're black or white, depending on whether they're closed or they're open, okay? So we just need to kind of figure out which one is ours here. So what we'll do is we'll plug in one into this, this expression here. 
So negative two minus one is actually gonna be negative three. Negative two minus zero is gonna be negative two. Then over here, when I plug in one into this expression, it'll be negative two plus two, which is zero. And when I plug two into this expression, it'll actually be negative two plus four because two times the two would make four, right? So negative two plus four is a positive two. And I like to draw it on my own and then just pick the one that matches. So I'm gonna go one and negative one, two, three, and put a big solid dot. Then I'm gonna go zero and negative two and put a normal dot. And it's obviously going in that direction. I tried, I just made it bigger, but it's okay. Now over here, we're gonna have one comma zero, but with a big open dot and then two comma two with a normal regular dot. And then that one's gonna go in that direction. And so we just have to figure out which one, it looks like this one's the only one that matches, right? They all have that point one zero, or this one doesn't even have the point one zero. These do, but they're not going up. See how mine with the open dot is going up? And these two with the open dot in the right spot are going down. So it can't be those. And this one doesn't even have the open dot in the correct spot at all. So it has to be this option, okay? On the test, the problems are all different. So some of them you'll type in an answer. Some of them is a multiple choice. And some of them just say, do this on your paper and then type in something when you're done. I don't remember what they say exactly to type in, but they say to type in something when you're done, okay? So you will be able to do it on your paper. The graphs are usually the ones that I have you do on the paper, okay? Just so that I can see how you graphed it. And then it's not like picking it from a choice. So it's a little bit different, this one. Okay, now the other ones, there's two of them actually because we had a question about writing the equations. So there's different ones that Abby write the equation. There's writing the rational equation, writing the polynomial equation, and then writing the equations that have transformations involved. So we'll try to go through all of those and then fill in the gaps with the rest of the problems afterward, okay? I feel like the one I have is probably the most trouble with is the polynomial equations. Like, I'm, I'm fairly all right with the other ones. Like, pers I guess personally, that's just what I was asking. I sure, sure. Yeah. So I'm going to skip over four and five for now. Um, let's see the polynomial ones. Oh, there they are. Okay. So the polynomial ones are here. We have two of them to practice. So I'm gonna zoom in a little bit so you can see that graph real good. Um, I'll zoom back out later in a minute if I need to. And let me focus. There it goes. So for this one, it says, find the polynomial of least degree having the graph shown. So the first thing we need to do is when we have this function here is know what the template is gonna look like. So we have that and then we have X minus whatever the first um, X intercept is with his multiplicity. And then whatever the second X intercept is with his multiplicity, the third and so on, right? The factors just keep going depending on how many X intercepts you have. Since you have one, to three x-intercepts, you're going to have three factors. And so the first one is a negative two, but if I put another negative two, it's actually gonna make it plus two. And here, if I minus five, it looks like x minus five. And if I plug in six, it looks like x minus six. So always remember, 
when it's on the graph, it is what it is. But when it goes into the factors, you're always going to have the x and then the opposite sign. So notice it was negative 2, but in here, it's x plus 2. Here, it was positive 5, but in the bubble or in the parentheses, it's x minus 5. And similarly, for the positive 6, it's x minus 6. Okay, so you have to be very careful with those. Make sure you're using the opposite um, signs. Then we have to use this point to figure out what the A is. So this is almost my answer. I'm not done yet. I haven't done the multiplicities yet. But once I do have the multiplicities in here, I will use that point to figure out the A. Once you know this A, this is the answer and they do want it in factored form. So you don't have to multiply it all out and, and have this big long polynomial, okay? You can write it in its factored form. Oh, the light went out again. It seems like the timer is shorter. <laughs> Okay, so for ours, the multiplicity depends on what the graph is doing. So if you're going to have an x-intercept and you're gonna cross through it going downward, or if you even cross through it going upward, that's multiplicity of one. If you have um, an x-intercept and it's kind of just touching it and then bouncing back off, whether it be at the top or whether it's going up to touch the x-intercept and then going back down. Both of those cases, the multiplicity is two. And then the last situation is if you have a wiggle. So if it goes like this, it wiggles through there or the other way around coming downward and then wiggling. In both of those cases, the multiplicity is three, okay? So you really have to, pay attention to what's happening. Now this one's really hard to see and I'm gonna try to zoom in a little bit more, but I don't know if you can see that white space in between the X axes and the curve. So if I were to zoom in really, really, really well, it is doing this in there, okay? I can see the little white space, but it's kind of hard to see, okay? <laughs> So it is going through the five and through the six. So, and it's obviously going through the negative two, right? It's just going boom, right through it. So this one's gonna have a multiplicity of one. The five is gonna have a multiplicity of one. And the six is even gonna have the multiplicity of one because it goes through it and then through the other one. So now I'm gonna use the point, right? This is my X and this is my y to figure out what this a value is. So I'm gonna plug in 30 for y. Remember, this is a fancy way of saying y. So this whole thing is gonna become 30. And then all of my x's are gonna become zeros. And I don't need to write one exponents. So I'm not writing the one exponent. So I get two times negative five times negative six, which is actually gonna be positive 60. And if I'm trying to solve for A, I'm just gonna divide by that positive 60. So when I reduce this in my calculator, I actually get one half equals A. So then I know what my function is gonna be. It's gonna be one half and then x plus two, and you don't have to write the one, x minus five, you don't have to write the one, and x minus six, again, you don't have to write the one, okay? And then this is your final um, answer. And for that one, you do have to type in your answer on the test, okay? So if you write one, you can write one over two in the front, I know what that means, or you could even use a decimal if you really wanted to. Both of those will be fine when you type in your answer.
now we do have another one as an example. So we'll try to do, trying to squish them both in the same screen. I think I need to zoom out a little bit. There we go. So for this one, um, I think I need my thing back. There we go. For this one, it's the same template, right? It's a polynomial function. So I know I'm going to have this template. And it's f of x equals a x minus c1, m1, x minus c2, m2, and so on and so forth, depending on how many x intercepts I have. C is the x intercept. And it's good to write all this stuff because you don't want to study specific problems because your polynomial is going to probably look different, right? So you want to know what's the template and where all the numbers are coming from, more so than being able to mimic an example, right? So we have our template, and then we can start plugging in some numbers here. So our x-intercepts are negative 5 and 3. So when I stick the negative 5 in the parentheses, it'll be x and then the opposite plus five. When I put this one in the parentheses, it'll be x, and since it's positive three, it'll be minus three. Now we have to figure out the multiplicity. Since the graph is going right through negative five, that one will have a multiplicity of one. This one comes down and touches it and then goes right back up. It kind of looks like an x squared function right there, okay? So that's why it's got a two power. And I don't have any more uh, x-intercepts, so I don't need any more to my function. Now I just need to use that point to figure out what a is. So remember, this is the x and this is the y. This is just a fancy way of saying y, right? So that f of x part is going to become a 9, and then all the x's are going to become zeros. You don't have to write the 1, but you do have to write a square because you got to remember to square it, okay? So we get a times five times negative three squared, which is a times five times positive nine, which is 45. And if I'm trying to solve for a, I'm going to divide both sides by that 45. So I can get a equal, and if I simplify that in the calculator, it's one fifth. So then now I know my function, the a is going to be one fifth. I don't have to write the one, but I do have to write the square. Okay. And in the computer, if you have to type this in, you just type one over five parentheses x plus five x minus three. And if you don't know how to get the exponent in there, you're going to hit shift six to get this little button up there and then two. And I know it means that that guy is raised to the two power. There's also a little box in when you try to type in an answer. If you look at the top menu, okay, in the top menu, there's going to be a button that looks like this. If you click on that, it lets you um, type in fractions and radicals and exponents, and you can just kind of see what's all in there and then try to uh, type in your, your equation. It's an option. You can still get your answer without ever having to click on that button. Um, but if you wanted to make it look real pretty, then you need to use the math equation editor inside the problem. Okay. It does take some getting used to. So if it's too much and it's wasting too much of your time, stop. Just type in what you got. I'm also going to see your paper, right? So as long as it looks good on your paper the way it should, you'll still be good. Okay, those are the only two I have for the polynomial ones. We do have some here for the rationals, but we'll wait till we build up to that because those are a little bit more involved. So let's go backtrack just a bit and get to the next um, set of problems. 
So these three problems are just for practice, just describing the transformations, okay? That's not what your, your review asks you to do. Your review asks you to graph them, okay? Um, which you could just create a table, plug in numbers and get it. it just, however you choose to graph that, that's fine. That's up to you. I just wanna know what happened to X cubed. Okay, so in this particular example, there's two things that happen to x cubed. The first thing is that there's this negative out front. And the second thing is instead of it just being x cubed, now it's x plus nine cubed. So there's two things happening. One, we have a negative in the front and two, we're adding something inside the basic function, okay? And so those do cause two specific transformations. When the negative is outside the power, it's different than when the negative is on the inside, okay? Since my negative is on the outside, this actually reflects over the x-axis. So it basically flips the graph upside down, okay? Then the plus nine on the inside actually shifts the graph over um, nine units to the left. It's the opposite because the left is negative numbers, right? But when it's on the inside, it does the opposite. It's not over here at positive nine, it's over at negative nine, okay? Now I should be able to draw that, okay? I know that regular X cube has points like this, and then it looks kind of like a little, you know, wiggle thing like that. Well, if it's gonna flip over and then shift to the left nine, that means right here, I'm gonna have the wiggle, but instead of going up, it's actually gonna go down. And instead of going down on the left, it's actually gonna go up, okay? So you can kind of get an idea of how to graph that. This one's just the original. It's not the one they asked me to graph. But this is what I wanted. I wanted to know what transformations happened, okay? Number seven is very similar, except this time it's an X squared function, right? So we wanna know what is happening here. There's three things happening here. You have this two out in the front. You have this minus five on the inside. And then you have a minus five on the outside, okay? So there's three things happening. When you multiply by a number bigger than one, what it does is it causes a vertical stretch by a factor of whatever that number is. So in this case, by a factor of two. Now we already know that if it does something on the inside here, it's gonna shift it and it's usually left or right. So the plus on the inside made it shift to the left, a minus on the inside should shift it to the right. So it's gonna have a shift. And I wrote over, I don't know why I wrote over. It's a shift of nine units to the left. And the same thing here, shift of, in this case, five units, but because it's a minus on the inside, it's actually to the right. And then the last minus five on the outside of the square, that goes up or down. So this one's gonna say shifts or shift of five units again, downward. If it were a plus five out here, it would go up five. But since it's a minus five, it's going downward. So the regular X squared looks like this or something like it, okay? It looks like that. But now you have a multiplier of two, which means instead of the point one, one, you have the point one, two, and instead of the point two, four, you have the point two, eight. So this makes it a little bit more narrow, right? I'm trying, <laughs> I can't draw. Um, then it shifts to the right five units and down five units. So going to the right five units would put the little peak there 
And then going down five units means the little peak is actually here. So we're gonna go over one and two, go over one and six more, two, four, six, about right there. So it's gonna look like this. And I'm trying to do it symmetrical, but you get the idea. And these are just my like partial steps. They're not the actual graph. So that's kind of what the graph should look like. But again, you don't have to do this to graph it. You could just plug in numbers, plug in zero, one, two, three, four, see where it goes and get the picture. But on the test, this is what I'm gonna ask you for. And you just type it all in, in words. Now, similarly for this problem, Again, on this one's multiple choice over here, but we're gonna describe the transformations. Here, there's only two things happening. You've got this two out here, and then you got a three plus three, but notice that the bar doesn't go over the three. So this three is like outside that radical, okay? And when the numbers being added or subtracted outside, it's moving it up or down. When you're adding or subtracting inside, that's when it moves left or right. But you still have a multiplier, so you still have a vertical stretch by a factor, coincidentally, of two again. And then because I'm adding three outside the radical, that's going to be a shift um, up three units. Okay, if it were minus three, then it would be going down three units. So the normal x squared is at zero, zero, and then it goes this way. So we need to have stretched it, which means it needs to be going up higher, faster. So instead of the point one, one, it would be at one, two. So it kind of goes like a little bit more open, right? And then it's actually shifting up one. So this little bottom part isn't down here, it's actually up at three. So it looks like the only one that's doing that is this graph here. See how that little starting point is lifted up and then it's going out pretty wide. So that's going to be our graph. So again, on the test, I'm just wanting to know what transformations happened, okay? Did it move left? Did it move right? Did it have a vertical stretch? Did it have a reflection? Okay, those kinds of things are what we're looking for on this problem. Now the next page we're gonna skip, but I definitely wanna talk about number 10. This one's the one where we're writing an equation, okay? But using the transformations. So we know that the absolute value of X should actually look like this. And it should have the point one, one, and it should have the point two, two, so on and so forth. This would have negative one, one, and negative two, two. And then they're asking you basically what happened to it, okay? And um, what is the new equation? What is this guy's equation? So the first thing I like to do is to identify if a vertical stretch occurred, okay? If I'm gonna have to multiply by a number outside, and as far as these are concerned, it's not an x squared graph. It's an absolute value graph, okay? The squared one looks like that. This is not an x squared or square root function. So in order for me to decide whether or not it had a vertical stretch is I basically need to see if this goes up one, 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 and one, if it goes in that pattern. And if you notice, here's the point at um, negative one and six. If you notice, if you go down and over, you do get to another point. If you go down and over one, you get to another point. So there's no vertical stretch going on, okay? So no vertical stretch, um, but it is flipped over, isn't it? It's supposed to be going upward like this, and it's flipped downward. So we do have a reflection. It's reflected across the X axes. That's what makes it flip downward, is when you flip over the X axis. And right here it says the graph of the square root of X. 
is translated, how many units, it tells you it's left. But remember, it's supposed to be here at zero, zero, and it did go to the left once, right? That little peak is scooted over one unit to the left. But it's also scooted one, two, three, four, five, six units up. Okay. So they kind of already told us what direction we just needed to tell them what, how many. But this is the big part is how do we write that in an equation? Okay. We know that if we reflect across the x axis, then we're going to have a negative in the front of the absolute value. And since there was no vertical translation, we don't have minus and then a number. It's just minus. But you did have some left or right movement. You actually had one unit to the left. Now, when it goes to the left, you actually put a plus inside the bars. So it will be plus one inside the bars. Then we translated six units up, up and down, Translations happen outside the basic function. So the, so the six will be outside the, the bars. And because it's up, it's actually gonna be plus six outside, okay? So these are the options for one and two. So for one, you had a drop down arrow and you could pick which one. Of course, it would be the absolute value, right? And then for number two, you had a drop down arrow and it's going to be the x axis. And in there, I mean, I didn't put it in the box, but this is what would be in the box. Okay, now we're getting into our arithmetic of functions. So for these, we have to like add, subtract, multiply, and divide. Now we will not have the domain on the test. We only ask you to do these parts, not the domain, okay? I mean, I'll do it because the problem asks you to on the review, but it won't ask you for this on the test, okay? Um, so for f plus g, remember what this means. It means the f function plus the g function. So I'm literally taking 5x plus 2, that whole function, and adding the entire second function. And then I can decide whether or not I need those parentheses. Since there's no number to distribute and no power to, to apply, this does not need parentheses. Now here I don't have a power to apply, but I really do have something to distribute. It's just, if you distribute a positive one, nothing changes. Four X is still positive four X and minus five is still negative five, okay? You just make sure you combine your like terms. So we get nine X minus three. Now F of X, minus g of x means I'm going to take 5x plus 2 minus 4x minus 5. Again, nothing to distribute, no power to apply, so I don't need these parentheses. But here, I do have a negative 1 that needs to be distributed, and that will change it to a minus 4x, a negative and a negative will change it to plus 5. And if I combine my like terms now, I get a single x plus seven. Then f of x times g of x means I'm going to have 5x plus 2 times 4x minus 5. And in order to get rid of these parentheses, I actually have to FOIL this out. So 5x times 4x is 20x squared. 5x times negative 5 negative 25x, two times four x, positive eight x, and two times negative five is negative 10. I can combine my like terms. And so then that's what's gonna go in the box.
And then the last one is to do f of x over g of x. And you could put the parentheses, but then you'll quickly realize that you don't need them on either the top or the bottom because no power, no exponent. And the same for the bottom, no, no power, no exponent, and no coefficient. So it just stays like that. You cannot reduce it at all. Now the domains for these are all gonna be negative infinity to infinity. F is a line. The domain of a line is negative infinity to infinity. This G is also a line. So the domain of G is gonna be negative infinity to infinity. So when you're doing the domain intersect with the domain of G, what do the two sets have in common? Well, they're the same exact set. So they have everything in common the whole way from negative infinity to positive infinity. So that's actually going to be your answer for the first three. If you wanna know the domain of the last one, it's this interval, but with any values that make the denominator zero removed. So in this case, if I have four X minus five equal to zero, I can add five to both sides, and then divide both sides by four, I get x equal to five fourths. So this domain should be negative infinity up until that five fourths, and then from five fourths to the positive infinity. So everything from negative infinity to positive infinity, but just not the five fourths, okay? So really your denominator cannot equal zero. So x cannot equal five fourths, which is why you take it out of the interval from negative infinity to infinity. It basically chops it up into two groups. Similarly, the same thing is gonna happen here. This is a polynomial, it's a quadratic, which has a domain of negative infinity to infinity. This one's also a quadratic or a polynomial. So it also has domain negative infinity to infinity. So these will all be negative infinity to infinity. And then all you have to do on this one is take out the one number that, or two numbers maybe, that make your denominator zero. So we'll talk about that one when we get down there. But for the plus. So you have five X squared minus two X plus X squared minus six plus three. There's really no need if you distribute a positive one, everything in that second parentheses will stay the same. And then combine your like terms. We get six X squared minus three X plus three. Then for the subtraction, we get um, five X squared minus two X. And if I distribute that minus, I get minus X squared plus X minus three, which gives me four X squared minus one X minus three. And then for the multiplication, Excuse me. I'm going to rewrite this so that I can multiply it out. So I'm going to take that first one and distribute it to the second parentheses. Then I'm going to take the second term and distribute it to the second parentheses. <coughs> Excuse me. I wish I brought my water in here, but I didn't. It's okay. and then combine our like terms. And 
And that's what we get for the multiplying part. <coughs> Excuse me. And then for the division part, we just get the top function over the bottom function. And the parentheses will go away. So I just writing it, writing it out. Um, now for the domain of this last one, you have to figure out where this thing equals zero because your denominator cannot equal zero. But I don't think that this actually equals zero. I can't factor that. So I'm gonna use my quadratic formula negative b plus or minus b squared minus four times a times c all over two a. Now this in here is gonna be a negative 11, which is imaginary, okay? This right here is imaginary, which means there's never gonna be a real number, right, on the number line that makes that denominator zero. So essentially there's nothing to omit from the negative infinity to infinity because that bottom thing will never, ever, ever equal zero, ever. So the domain of this one happens to also be negative infinity to infinity because I didn't get any real number answers here to remove from the negative infinity to infinity. So if there's nothing to remove, then negative infinity to infinity is just the answer. Sounds a little weird. Let me see how we're doing on time. Okay, we have 12 minutes. This one's good. Let me zoom in so you could see. So again, it really does need us to know how to rewrite this. So make sure you know how to rewrite that. And then if the x is two, what is the y value for the f function? The curvy one is the f function. So when x is two, that y value is four. When x is two, what is the value of the g function? Well, the line is the g function. So when x is two, the y value is one. So you should get five for that top one. Now here, it's f of negative one minus g of negative one. So when x is negative one, f is actually positive one. And when x is negative one, g is actually four. So we get negative three in the end. Now this means f of zero times g of zero. So here's zero, f of zero is just zero, and then g of zero is three. So we still get zero. Zero times three is still zero. This one is f of negative one over g of negative one, and f of negative one, I feel like we already did the negative one. Yeah, f of negative one was one, and g of negative one was four and that does not reduce, so the answer is just one-fourth there. Similarly with the chart, it does the same thing, except you already know what the y values are. You don't need to go look for them in the, in the graph. They're already there in a table. So if I'm doing f plus g of three, I'm going to look for x equal to 3, and I'm going to take the f and the g, and I'm going to add them together. So in this case, I would get, uh, what is that, 7? Here, I'm looking at the x value 6, and I'm looking at the f and the g value, and there I'm going to subtract them. So the f value minus the g value would give me positive 7. Here, we're looking at the x value negative 3. So we're going to take this f and this g, and we're going to multiply them together. Well, 0 times 5 is just 0. And then here, we're going to take, when x is 0, the f over the g. Well, that would be 3 over 0, but this is undefined. 
Okay, so that one's a little weird. You can't really do that one. You would have to say it's undefined, okay? If it wasn't, if it was like three and then one, you would just do three over one, which is three and type it in the box. But since it's three over zero, that is undefined. Okay, we mm, got about nine minutes left. So let's see if we can get to this one. So here it has two functions and it's asking me to find h of f of six. So remember the little method we talked about. You plug the six into f first and then that answer will get plugged into h, okay? So I'm gonna first figure out what f of six is by plugging in six into the f function. I get negative 24 minus one, which is negative 25. Then that whole entire negative 25 is gonna get plugged into h. This is my h function. So it's gonna be negative of negative 25 plus one, which turns it into positive 25 plus one, which gives me an ultimate value of 26, okay? So you plug this into the first one that's next to it, and then the answer gets plugged into the one that's far away, okay? We also need to know how to do this with a table, okay? So here they're asking me to do this. So this is the X value and I need to plug it into the G. So this is the G box. So when my X is 10, the Y value that I get is eight. So then now what I need to do is I need to figure out F of eight. So I go look for where X is equal to eight and its Y value is actually this 11. So the final stopping point is the 11 and that's the actual answer is 11. So once you get the first guy's uh, y value, you use that as an x value to find the other guy. Okay, let's see. This one's got a bunch of parts. We might be able to finish it in six minutes. Let's see. If not, I will pause the video and then resume recording as soon as the class is over. Um, so this one gives me a quadratic equation that's all expanded out, okay? And they want the vertex, the axis of symmetry, the domain, the range, and then they also want the intervals for which it's increasing and the intervals for which it's decreasing, and they also want the graph, okay? So vertex is the first thing that we find. And in order to find the x value of the vertex, you do negative b over 2a. In the book, it's also known as h, okay? But it is the x value of the vertex. So in this case, b is the number in front of x, which is the negative 6, and a is the number in front of x squared, which is 1. So I get 6 over 2, which is 3. So I know that the x value is three. Well, in order for you to find the y value, which they label as k, you're just gonna plug in that number into the function. So I'm gonna be plugging in f of three. So three squared minus six times three plus 11. That's nine minus 18 plus 11, negative nine plus 11, I got two. So that is my vertex. The axis of symmetry is always x equal to whatever you got for your, the x value you got for your vertex. So since I got three for my x value, this should be x equal to three. Not three by itself, it's a whole equation. Notice it says type an equation. So it must say x equals that three. The domain of any polynomial is always negative infinity to infinity. And here, if you notice that the A in the front is equal to one, right? That's positive, which means it will open upward. And since it opens upward, the range should be from this Y value up to positive infinity. And I know what the Y value of that vertex is, it's two. 
So this should be from two all the way to positive infinity. Now, the intervals for which it's increasing or decreasing, well, it's actually, de if it's opening upward, it's decreasing until it gets to that X value of the vertex. And then it's increasing from the vertex X value to positive infinity. So for this interval, it's, which one is this one? This one is increasing, which is the right side, right? This side. So it's from um, the three X value to positive infinity, which is all the way to the right, all the way to the right. And then it's decreasing over here on the left side, which is all the way to the left, negative infinity, up to this X value of three. So this would be from negative infinity to three. And that should be enough for me to graph it. So if I go three and two, we got that there. If you want another point, just plug in four, right? So four squared is 16. Six times four is 24 plus 11. That's gonna be what? Negative eight plus 11, which is three. So then you got this point here and then due to symmetry, you'll have another one over there. And so you have your little image there. And I think we still have two minutes left. I don't think two minutes is gonna be enough to cover these word problems. So I will do these in the video later, but real quick, we can do these in like two seconds. These two right here. So remember the end behavior. If you have a positive x to the odd, it looks like this. If you have a negative x to the odd, it goes in the other direction. If you have a positive x to the even, they both go up. And if you have a negative x to the even, they both go down. This one is a multiple choice problem. So if you're looking at the polynomial, you're going to circle a term that has the highest exponent. In this case, it's that term. Notice it has a negative in the front and an odd exponent. So it's a negative x to the odd, which means it should have this in behavior, which is actually a. If I'm looking at that one, it's not in the correct order, but you should be concentrating on the guy with the highest exponent, which happens to be this term. It is a negative number in front and an even exponent. So that's this situation, which means both of the ends should be going down, okay? So you're always looking at the term with the highest exponent to decide which one of these cases you have, okay? And it doesn't matter what number's in front, all that matters is the sign. And it doesn't matter what number is up here, all that matters is if it's odd or even. We don't care if it's 10 versus two, none of that matters, just if it's odd or even. Okay, I'm gonna stop here. I'm already running out of time. Um, I'm going to pause the video for now, but then I will resume once we're all finished. Um, let me pause it. Okay, we're gonna finish up with number 27. So here, remember what's in the parentheses. Whenever you have x squared, it can, or any just x, it can be rewritten as x minus zero. And when you don't have a multiplicity up there, it is understood to be one. This one had a square, so it should have a square. And then x plus three squared. So you can rewrite it like that so that you get all of the bits of information that you need in order to graph it, okay? Um, now notice that the coefficient in the front is a one. So a equals one, which means it's positive, right? And if I add up all these exponents together, two, one, and two, I'm gonna get x to the fifth power, which is odd, okay? So this is really gonna follow the in behavior as x, a positive x to the odd, which according to up there, it will look like going downward on one end and upward on the other. So just by looking at my um, ending in behavior, you can kind of already outrule this option and this option just because of the in behavior, right? Those are going up on the left and not down on the left, okay? 
So, but on the test, you do have to graph it yourself. So being able to decipher or choose the best option is not the strategy you wanna take on the test. You really wanna actually be able to graph this by yourself, okay? So what we're gonna do is we're gonna identify the zeros or x-intercepts, right? It's the same thing with their multiplicities. So if we look at that, remember when we take this out of the parentheses, it turns the opposite sign. So that's just zero. And it has multiplicity of two because the exponent is two. Then the next zero we get, when you take this out, it's gonna turn to positive three, but it has a multiplicity of one. And then the last one, when I take the three out of there, it's gonna turn to negative three, but that one has a multiplicity of two. And I can't fit it in there, so let me write it underneath. M equal to two. So what this means, if you have an even multiplicity, if it's two, that means it's going to touch um, x equal to zero. If you have m equal to one, that means it's gonna cross at x equal to three. And then for the negative three, you have a multiplicity at two, so it's going to touch at the x equals negative three, okay? So you basically have a graph and you have the intercept zero, negative three, and positive three. You know what the end behavior is gonna look like. It's gonna go down and up, okay? But we know that through negative three, we're only touching it. So it'll go back down at some point, okay? Then through zero, it's gonna touch it. So at some point you have to come back up and then just touch it and go back down. But then at, um, x equal to positive three, it says it's gonna cross through it. So it'll come back up, but then it'll just go right through there, okay? And so you have to find the one that kind of matches this. Now, if you notice, this one has two humps at the bottom, and this one has two humps at the top. My picture doesn't have humps at the top, so it's definitely not this one. It has to be this one. On your paper, if you really wanna know what those y values are, you probably have to plug in some numbers. So if I were to make a chart here, and I'm gonna go sideways because I don't wanna run into the other space. Um, if I were to plug in negative two, negative one, one, and two, um, we can use the, the calculator ability, right? To see what those Y values are gonna be so that we can draw those curves a little bit better, okay? So I'm gonna program my calculator. Um, I'm gonna do negative two stores X, and then I'm gonna write X squared parentheses X minus three and X plus three with the power two and hit enter, I get negative 20. Now negative, oops, negative one stores X. I'm gonna go plug it back into that expression and I get negative 16. One stores X, plug it in, I get negative 32. And then two stores X, I get negative 100. So that's probably why they have this thing going from uh, 50 or 150 to 150. So if I do that, let's say one, two, three, four, I'm only gonna go to negative 100 and one, two, three, four, and positive 100, since I don't have anything crazy. Now at negative two, it's negative 20. That's 25. So it's probably about right there. Then for negative one, it's negative 16, which is probably a little bit higher than that. So it's going like this. Now over here, 25, 50, 32 is probably about right there. And then negative 100 is down here. So this one's got to go way over there and then go back up through that x-intercept. And so then that does better match this one, right, where it has a little dip and then it has a really large or further down dip, okay? And so you got to you get a better idea of what that graph looks like, okay? So that's how you would graph it on your paper. You would need to identify your x-intercepts and their multiplicities so that you know whether or not they touch or cross. 
also look up your end behavior because that would help you as well. And then you just put it all together to graph it. So we're gonna similarly do the same thing for this one. Now, this one has a hidden one there, but other than that, nothing else is missing. So when I take this out, it'll be positive one, and that's an odd, uh -uh, this is three, which means it'll actually wiggle through that one. Here, when I take it out of the bar, out of the parentheses, it'll be negative three, but because it's one, it will cross. So one exponent crosses, two exponent touches, right? And then three exponent wiggles. So we're gonna look, well, let me turn the light first. <laughs> So we're gonna look and see what the end behavior would look like too. Again, we have a positive coefficient. If I add those together, I would get four, which is an even. So a positive X to the even goes up on both sides. So immediately we would know which graph it is, okay? But if we're doing it on the test, it's not gonna be as easy as that, okay? So you have one X intercept at one and another one at three. And we know it's gonna go up on both ends. Um, and we know it's gonna wiggle through the one and it's going to um, have this negative three here. Now, I don't think that's enough. So I'm actually gonna make me a chart and I'm gonna plug in um, negative two and negative one and zero. These three numbers in the middle since I already know what's gonna happen on the ends, I don't really need to know those Y values. So I'm gonna come in here and say negative two stores X, parentheses X minus one to the third power, and then X plus three and no power, and I get negative 27, then negative one stores X. I'm gonna plug that in. I get negative 16 and then zero stores X. Go plug it in and I get negative three, okay? So again, this one's going all the way down to 150. I think I only need 30 though. One, two, three, one, two, three. So for negative two, it's negative 27, which is pretty close to negative 30, right? Negative one is 16. So if this is negative 20 and that's negative 10, it's probably close to the middle in there. And then zero and negative three, which means it's probably close to the axes here. Now remember, we gotta wiggle through this one, but we gotta just cross through that one, okay? So for this one, we can see that what's happening, um, It's kind of doing this thing. I can't really draw it. It's not changing the way, it's not wiggling through there. It's just because my X axes and my Y axes are not the same. I did plug it into the right function, right? X plus three. Mm -hmm. So here, even though I know it's gonna go up, it has to wiggle, which means it's gonna go like this, okay? And then, oh, I see what I'm doing. It has to cross through negative three and it has to wiggle through one. So it does do a wiggle over there. So it crosses through here, gets to this little guy, then it does this and then see how it's going. It's going like that and then it wiggles upward, okay? So it does kind of look like that. Mine just looks a little bit weirder. It kind of looks like this. But again, your graph doesn't need to be perfect. I just need to understand that you have the gist of it. Um, it doesn't need to be like an exact graph. It's just a sketch. It just needs to have all of those critical identifying parts, right? So it has to have the correct in behavior, the correct x-intercepts, the correct crossing, wiggling, or touching on the x-intercepts, um, and maybe even the correct y-intercept. Um, 
Other than that, you should be able to graph it. And if you need any other values, make sure you make a table so you can kind of fill in the gaps of if you don't know where what's happening in that region. Okay. But I always say sketch because these are not perfect graphs or perfect images. And I totally skipped over this problem. So I'm gonna do this problem first before we keep going. Uh, these are the word problems. And so in the first one, it says, if an object is projected upward from the ground level with an initial velocity of 32 feet per second, then its height in feet after t seconds is given by this equation here. Find the number of seconds it will take to reach the maximum height. What is the maximum height? Remember, t is in seconds and h is in the height, okay? Or s is actually the height. So um, if I want to know the t, well, remember, this is kind of like acting like the y and t is kind of acting like x. So when you're trying to find the maximum or minimums, you're trying to find that vertex, right? This is a parabola and I want to find that vertex. And because the front is negative, it's actually a downward parabola, which makes sense of why there's a maximum. But how do I find the X value of the maximum? That would be the H, right? And I don't want to use H or X because X is not in this problem and H could get confused with height, okay? But H is actually um time okay that's the variable that's acting like x is t for time so when i do that i'm going to do the negative b over 2a and in this case b is 32 and a is negative 16 so i get negative 32 over negative 32 which is actually a positive one so the object will take just one second to reach its maximum height now, what is the maximum height? You have to find the y value. So I'm basically plugging in one for t. And so you end up with positive 16, okay? Now, for the next example, it says the total amount spent by some number of people on clothing and footwear in the years 20, I'm sorry, 2000 and 2009 can be modeled by the quadratic function and they give me my whole quadratic function where X equals zero represents January 2000, X equal to one represents January 1, 2001, and so on. F of X is in billions of dollars. So the Y value is in billions of dollars. According to the model, in what year during this period was the amount spent on clothing and footwear in maximum? So again, you have a parabola, but downward. So it makes sense they're asking you for a maximum. So we do have X here. So X is negative B over 2A. B is the number in front of X. And A is the number in front of uh, X squared. And I don't know what that is, so I'm just going to type that in here. Negative parentheses 71.44 over 2 times negative 4.193. And we get this value. And it says round the final answer for the amount spent on the nearest whole number is needed. Round all intermediate values um, to the nearest tenth as needed. So I got. 8.5 something, okay? Now, remember that X equal to one represents January 1st. So this eight, or January 1st of 2000 is X equal to zero. X equal to one is January 1st, 2001. So if I got X equal to eight, that's gonna put me at January 1st, 2008. But because I have a 0.5, it's not going to be January 1st. It's probably going to be more like halfway into the year, which is probably going to be like the end of June. Okay. But it doesn't matter what month I'm in. All that matters is the year that I'm in. Okay. So it says in the year, that would be 2008. And if they want to know the billions of dollars, well, I have to plug in that number into the function. But it does say round the immediate values to the nearest tenth. And I did, right? I wrote 8.5. 
So what that means is you're going to plug in 8.5 into your function. Now, I'm not about to do that. So I'm going to do 8.5 store x. And then I'm just going to type in my whole uh, function. x squared plus 71.44 x plus 97.19. And when I hit enter, it's going to plug in the 8.5. And it says to round that to the nearest whole number. So this four is not going to change that. It's just going to be 401. So apparently about $401 billion was spent on clothing and footwear. Now, the last example on this page is the Bob owns a watch repair shop. He has found that the cost of operating his shop is given by this function where C is the cost and X is the number of watches repaired. How many watches must, be, must he repair to have a lowest cost? Now, this is a positive polynomial, so it goes like this. So it makes sense that they're asking for a low point, okay? But it's still the vertex. So X equals negative B over 2A, which in this case is negative 192 and 3. So 192 divided by 6 is 32. And all it wants to know is how many watches. Remember, x is the number of watches. So then I already know the number of watches that need to be made. I don't need to know what the cost, the minimal cost or lowest cost is. I just need to know that that's how many watches are going to have to be made to get that lowest cost. Okay. Okay, now we can continue. We already did these in class. So now we're getting into the last chapter that we covered, which was the asymptotes. So for the vertical asymptotes, you take your denominator and you equal it to zero. In this case, x minus three equals zero. If I add three on both sides, I get x equals three. So remember, type in an equation. x equals three is the equation. There are not two vertical asymptotes, there's just one. Now for the horizontal asymptote, you have to consider the degree. So the degree of the numerator is actually zero because there's no x's in the numerator. The degree of the denominator is one because I do have x's in the denominator and the highest exponent is one, the little invisible one, okay? Now here, that means that the degree of my numerator is actually less than the degree of my denominator. When your numerator's degree is smaller than the denominator's degree, you automatically have a horizontal asymptote at y equal to zero. We never have oblique asymptotes. And since you do have a horizontal asymptote, you can't say you don't have neither, okay? Now for this problem, same thing for the vertical asymptote, we take our denominator and we equal it to zero. So four X plus two equal to zero. If I minus two on both sides, I get four X equals to negative two. If I divide by four on both sides, I get X equals negative one half once I reduce that in my calculator. And so then for my vertical asymptote, I do get negative one half. Um, now for the horizontal asymptote, the degree of our numerator, this time we do have x and the exponent is one. And in the denominator, I do have x. And again, the exponent is one. Now when the degree of the numerator equals the degree of the denominator, we have the horizontal asymptote at y equals the leading coefficient of the numerator over the leading coefficient of the denominator. So remember, we were looking at the guy with the degree one, which means we were looking at this term and this term to decide what the degree was. Well, what is the coefficient of those two terms? For the top, the coefficient is negative two. For the denominator, the coefficient is four, which reduces down to negative one half. So it just so happens that our horizontal asymptote is also negative one half. Okay, and there are no oblique asymptotes in this chapter for us. So just keep saying there's no oblique asymptote.
Now, in order for me to graph it, I do have to find all of those um, values. So I have to find intercepts and I have to find um, asymptotes and then maybe create a chart to get some extra points. So the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna try to find the y-intercept. And to do that, we just plug in zero for x. And I get negative two over seven, which is about, because I am gonna have to draw this, is about negative 0 0.3, okay? Then I need to find the x-intercepts that you take by taking the numerator equal to zero. So x minus two equal to zero, which means x equals two. So I have an x-intercept of two. And I'm gonna actually draw it over here instead of picking a graph. So I have one, two, there's my x-intercept and my y-intercept, one, two, three, negative 0.3 is probably about right there. So those are my two intercepts. Then I need to do my vertical asymptote. So I'm gonna take my denominator and equal it to zero. I get X equals negative seven. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And I have a dotted line here. So right away, I can tell that this one's wrong because this asymptote is on the wrong side. And this one, the asymptote is on the wrong side. So it could be one of these two as far in the computer. But for me, I'm gonna have to actually graph this thing. Um, and then our horizontal asymptote, um, notice that we have exponent one, exponent one. So it's gonna be at y equals the number in front of this x and the number in front of that x. So one over one, which is just one. So then that means I'm gonna have a dotted line going in this direction, okay? And it does keep going further and further, even past the vertical asymptote. Now, the thing is, is that I can tell what's happening over here because we know that this has to trail off close to there. And we know that this eventually has to go downward toward our asymptote. What we don't know is what's going on over here on this side. Is my graph up here? between the two asymptotes or is my graph down here between the two asymptotes? We won't know unless we create a chart and we plug in some numbers past this negative seven vertical asymptote. So if I plug in negative eight, if I plug in negative eight, I'm gonna get negative 10 over negative one, which is 10, which means I do have a point way up there. And so then the function is up here above the horizontal asymptote, okay? And as far as these two are concerned, this one has the right image, right? It has the part going up at the top above y equal to one, and then it has the part down here at the bottom below the y equal one onto the right. So it's going to be that. On your paper, I would wanna see this. Hopefully you don't kind of crowd it in with your work. You can kind of scoot over to the side and draw a picture a little bit prettier. Um, now, these were really good. These are the ones where they asked us to find the equations. So we have to remember that your vertical asymptotes are going to give you your denominators, denominator factors. Your x-intercepts are going to give you your numerator factors. Um, the horizontal asymptote um, can tell you the exponents of the factors. Um, and usually the multiplicity tells you the exponents of these factors. So since you already know the numerator factors, the horizontal asymptote actually tells you the exponents of the denominators factors. Okay, now if the horizontal asymptote is at y equal to zero, then that tells you that the degree of the numerator has to be less than the degree of the denominator. But if the horizontal asymptote 
is at y equals a number, that tells you two things. It tells you the degree of um, the numerator is equal to the degree of the denominator, and it tells you a. If you don't know the horizontal asymptote and you don't have a, you can also use the y-intercept to find a, kind of like what we did with the polynomials, okay? So in this particular problem, um, I'm gonna have to zoom in so we can see where the x-intercepts are and the vertical asymptotes and all that good stuff. So let me focus here. So I can see this is the origin here and we do have a point there at the origin. Um, and then it looks like it's going one, two, and then three, four. And then the top is going one, two, three, four. So they're also going by units of one. So it looks like the horizontal asymptote is at y equals one. Um, and it looks like our vertical asymptote, this one here, is at x equals one. And it looks like we have x intercepts of zero and one. Now notice that the graph crosses through each of them. So the m is equal to one for both of those x-intercepts, okay? So if I put this information together, okay? If I put the information together, this is what I'm gonna come up with. I'm gonna have um, y equals x minus zero, x minus one, both with like a one exponent, right? At the bottom, I only have one vertical asymptote, which means x minus that value one. Now, the y um, horizontal asymptote, it's actually a number, it's one, it's not zero, right? Which means the degree of the numerator and the degree of the denominator should be exactly the same. Well, notice I have one and one, which is two, but downstairs, I don't have a power of two but I know I should. So we have to make this a power of two. Not only that is that it tells me what A is. Since I have that number, I know that A in the front would have to be a one. And then I can clean this up. It doesn't have to look so messy. Um, it looks like they want us to write F of X instead of Y. You don't have to write this one. You don't have to write that one. You don't even have to write the zero. You could just write X and then x minus one, you don't have to write that one exponent, and then x minus one squared. Oh, and I'm sorry, that x-intercept was not at one, it was at two, which means this numerator factor should be two. And I was kind of looking at it, and I'm like, well, why wouldn't they cancel? Because that's the wrong number. <laughs> so it helped me catch that there was an error there. Remember, x-intercepts give you the numerator factors, and the multiplicity tells you what the exponents are on those factors. Um, and then the horizontal asymptote is what gives you the power in the denominator, and it could also give you a. Now let's see if we apply that same thing here. So we do have x-intercepts at zero and four, zero and four, and they go through each of them. So this has a multiplicity of one. This one has a multiplicity of one. We have a vertical asymptote at x equals, if this is two, that looks like it might be three. And we have a horizontal asymptote at y equals one. So let's put it together. We have y equals, um, x minus zero with the one, x minus four with the one, and x minus three at the bottom. Because the horizontal asymptote is y equals a number, it means the degree of the top and the bottom should be the same. Since those together make two, my denominator should have a two. And the a is given to me, the a is one. So when you write your function, remember this guy can be written as x, x minus four without the one and x minus three squared. 
So in this case, I think this is your proper solution. Okay. Last one we have, I'm gonna leave that there. I'm gonna kind of put it over so I can still see all these little notes. These would be good notes to have on your, um, next to you when you take the test. So for this one, we have two vertical asymptotes. There's another one here. And we only have one x-intercept and negative two. So my x-intercept is gonna be negative two, but notice that it wiggles through there, okay? Because it wiggles, the multiplicity is actually three there. Now your vertical asymptotes, you have um, one at negative five and one at zero, okay? Oh no, it doesn't wiggle there. It does the wiggle about right there, okay? So this is not actually wiggling here. It almost looks like it, but the wiggle actually starts there, okay? Which is above the x-intercept. I don't know if you could see that. It's kind of really hard to see. So see, it's not wiggling through here. It's just going right through it. The wiggle actually happens about right here. Okay, so about right there is where the wiggling is happening, but that's not an x-intercept, okay? So my multiplicity, because the wiggle happens here, it doesn't happen here. My multiplicity isn't three, it's just one. And I promise on the test, it won't be like that close to each other. If there's a wiggle, it's gonna be on the x-intercept, okay? Um, let me zoom back out. So we can resume. So we've got the y x intercepts, we've got the vertical asymptotes. The horizontal asymptote happens to be the y axis, which is y equal to zero. So that tells me that the degree of the numerator is less than the degree of the denominator. So if I put this together, um, I'm going to have. x, now instead of a minus two, it's gonna be plus two with the power of one, and then x plus five and x minus zero. And according to this, I should have a higher exponent at the bottom, which makes sense, because when I do x times x, I'm gonna get x squared, whereas the top only has a degree of one, okay? So what we end up with is x plus two, and then instead of writing x minus zero, you could just write x, and you could also write it in the front. So I think out of all these options, this one is the one that you want to choose. Okay. And we didn't have an A value, but if you really were curious, if you were to be like, well, hey, I don't know if there's an A multiplied by X plus two. You could figure it out. You could pick a point that you know that there's a value for it. So. I don't even see a point in here where I would know the value for it. So they probably don't want the A, okay? But for the test, if there's another point that's like, hey, the coordinates of the point are this, this and this, then you can plug that Y value in here, plug that X value for all the Xs, and you could figure out what A is. But I highly doubt that it's that complicated. I think, um, for the most part, you can just forget about the A because there's not going to be a defined point. But this is the end of what I had selected for you guys to concentrate on for the test. So if you have any questions about the other problems in the review that we did not get to, um, make sure that you ask. And if you want me to elaborate or explain better or in a different way, um, some of the problems that I did in this video, um, just let me know and I can do that as well, okay? So just let me know what you need and I will help you, okay? But you guys have a good one and I wish you the best of luck on test two. Bye.